the completion of the immense good that is found there. Read in isolation, the two passages I've just quoted might seem to imply that no possible world contains a more perfect state or government with more virtue and happiness than could be found in the city uh, or kingdom of God in the actual best of all possible worlds. Consistency with the theodicy as a whole may, might require a more restrained interpretation, as much virtue and happiness and perfection as is permitted by the order of the universe and a due regard to the perfection of non-rational creatures. But notwithstanding any compromise that divine wisdom might ordain among competing values in the universe, Leibniz is clearly committed to the claim that the perfection and happiness enjoyed by rational creatures in the city of God, or kingdom of grace, as he sometimes calls it, are great indeed. Because of its relevance to the question of divine justice, this claim about the city of God is as crucial for Leibniz's theodicy as his claims about the best possible world, and is, I believe, the claim which Voltaire's objections should have led him to attack. How can Leibniz's assertion of the immense actual value and happiness of rational creatures be defended against such objections? As, as I have noted, his positive argument for this assertion is an appeal to God's supreme perfection. But that argument may not be entirely convincing in the absence of plausible responses to questions and objections such as Voltaire's. Where and when is the life of rational creatures so gloriously better and happier than it often seems to be in our here and now. Leibniz's responses to such questions regularly involve some appeals to ignorance, but he seeks starting points in what he thinks we do know about the universe. He calls, for instance, on Copernican astronomy as a resource for theology. Modern discoveries, he says, give us larger views of the works of God, providing a distant view of plenty of room for societies of rational creatures far happier and more perfect than we are. Uh, quote nine, our earth is merely a satellite of one sun, and there are as many suns as fixed stars, and it is credible that there is immense space beyond all the fixed stars. So nothing rules out the possibility of either the suns or especially the region beyond the suns being inhabited by happy creatures. Yet even planets may be or become as happy as paradise. More important, Leibniz believed he had adequate metaphysical reasons, as well as the support of divine revelation, for affirming the immortality of souls. And a future life beyond the veil of death affords plenty of room for manifestations of virtue and happiness not yet experienced by us. Eschatology plays a central part in Leibniz's theodicy. He locates in a future life the best parts of the perfection and happiness of the city of God, quoting St. Paul's declaration in Romans 8.18 that the afflictions of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the future glory that will be revealed in us. At the same time, as Leibniz notes, doctrines of punishment, indeed eternal punishment, in the future life threatened to aggravate enormously the difficulty of the theological problem of evil. Leibniz's argument for the happiness of those who love God in this life and the next will be the topic of section three of this lecture, and his views on the destiny of less virtuous souls will be discussed in section four. <laughs> section three, perfection, happiness, and love for God. In the Theodicy and many other writings, Sometimes, indeed, with evangelistic fervor, Leibniz proposes intellectual enlightenment, and his philosophy in particular, as a way of salvation or of blessedness, as I think he might prefer to call it in this context. This way of blessedness is built around a conception of essential relationships among love, perfection, and happiness. In the Theodicy and elsewhere, Leibniz evinces a deep conviction that the love of God above all things is the principle of true religion, to which he is willing to add that this love is greater in proportion as it is more enlightened, plus éclairé. And by the very nature of love, Leibniz claims, this love has power to make the lover happy. 
defining the nature of love in the principles of nature and grace uh, in 1714, he states that, the pure, that pure genuine love consists in the state that makes one taste pleasure in the perfections and the happiness of the object of one's love and reasons that since God is the most perfect and the happiest of substances, that love must give us the greatest pleasure of which one is capable when God is its object. Quote 11. Leibniz sees such blessed love for God as arising from knowledge of God's perfections. To love God, he says in the Theodicy's preface, it suffices to envisage God's perfections. Indeed, he holds that one loves God more, the more one can give a reason for one's love. That is why the way to blessedness he recommends is an intellectual, indeed a philosophical way. Leibniz's univocal attribution of properties to God and to creatures, including us, helps prepare this way of blessedness. It is easy to envisage God's perfections, Leibniz says in the preface to the Theodicy, because we find in ourselves their ideas, because they are unlimited versions of perfections of our own souls. This univocity thesis instantiates a fundamental doctrine of Leibniz's theology and of his metaphysics. He defined God as ein's perfectissimum, the most perfect being, or more precisely, as a being that has all perfections, by which he means all the absolutely simple, purely positive qualities from which all other positive qualities must be derived by conjunction or by limitation. Understanding reality in a sense in which a thing has reality just to the extent that it has positive qualities, Leibniz infers that the reality of all the less perfect beings, including, of course, our reality, must be constituted by limited versions of the divine perfections. Why would knowledge of God's perfections give rise to love for God? How or why would one be disposed to find pleasure and happiness in God's perfectness? Leibniz's answer to this question is rooted in his conceptions of pleasure and happiness. He defines happiness as a durable state of pleasure. He typically defines pleasure simply as a feeling, sensus, sentiment, and findum, of perfection. There are places where he defines pleasure rather as the feeling of an increase in perfection. More often, however, he seems to ignore this complication, and here I will ignore it too. A more urgent question is raised by passages in Leibniz's writings that could be read as suggesting that he felt, suggesting that the felt perfection that constitutes one's pleasure must be one's own perfection. This suggests at best a useless precision, as Gaston Grua rightly remarks in his magisterial study of Leibniz's ethics, for knowledge and love transport us into the perfection of the object. That's Grua's way of putting it. Uh, Leibniz gives a more complete account of his view when he says, quote, 12, pleasure is a knowledge or feeling of perfection, not only in ourselves, but also in another, for then some perfection is evoked in us. The perfection of a created substance in Leibniz's monadological metaphysics is perfection of its perceptions and powers of perception. The monadology suggests the distinctness of the perceptions as a measure of the substance's perfection. Leibniz's writings on love suggest that perfection of the object perceived also adds to the perfection of a perception, as one might expect in a philosophy of broadly platonic inspiration. In view of these considerations, we may expect, as Leibniz sees things, that a person who has an unclouded knowledge of God's perfections will find great pleasure in knowing them, indeed greater pleasure in knowing them than in knowing anything else. And this state, if durable, will constitute the greatest happiness possible for us. And a person finding his or her greatest happiness in God's perfection will, on Leibniz's view, by definition indeed, love God above all things. <clears throat> 